Okay, so let's get uh, started. Uh, my name is Song Liu, and this is Boris. We we both work for Meta, and today we're going to share our like idea to use BPF LSM and FS Verity for binary authorizations. So uh, what we do with the binary authorization, basically. We say we want to make sure only trusted binary can perform certain critical uh, operations, like access certain device, access certain file, open certain port. And so here are some requirements we want to enforce here. First, we want to verify the hash. We want to say, okay, this is the binary we build. And versus like uh, traditionally there are solutions, we will just verify the path. And but uh, without verifying the hash, there's no way you know the binary is actually the one you trust. And we want to build a set of flexible policies and like because access pattern will be different. For example, we have the, uh, for example, we want to verify, okay, only uh, verify the uh, signed BPF trace binary can open a signed BPF trace script and we need to be able to have a policy that uh, describes this restriction. And we want to upload the allow list and uh, uh, maybe a block list at the wrong time so that uh, the primary use case is like, we don't want to reboot the server. We will just want to update as we release new binaries. And next we want a smaller attack surface and which means uh, we just mentioned allow list and the block list, and we need to update that at the wrong time. We don't want uh, to be required to, to protect the allow list. So if the hacker have a certain permission to attack the, the allow list, it's break the, the protection. For that, we, we think we need to get asymmetric tree keys. Basically, you have the private key only available at the trusted uh, building systems. And then like uh, you only deliver the signed public, uh, the signature to the servers that's running it. So you don't really have to protect the allow list. Okay, so now existing, uh, existing solutions there, we, we found two things that are similar to what we are proposing. One is uh, IMA or people call it IMA. Basically this, uh, we found this a very complicated, uh, sophisticated uh, systems, and it seems to not design for the use case we are targeting. And also we found Emma is not flexible enough. There are cases you need to like uh, have a trusted boot, uh, have a secure boot, then you have a trusted boot. It's just, you need to switch your behavior with a reboot, which is not a, uh, uh, it's not possible for our use cases. And another thing is like the FS variety itself have a built-in signature uh, features. And what it does like if you have this binary is uh, you want it to sign, you attach a signature. And if someone accidentally modified the file either by like uh, writing to it or maybe writing bypass it directly to the block device and you will know that. And the problem with this uh, uh, field-in signature is like it's not protecting the file metadata, which means if you remove the file and place the, uh, another file with the same name in the same location, you will lose the protection. And naturally the kernel will think, oh, this is not a protected file. You can just do whatever you want. So, and... Now I'll hand to Boris to talk about the uh, FS variety. Yeah, so just a little background since I assume most people don't know what this is offhand. Um, FS variety is a generic layer inside the VFS that uh, provides this kind of efficient hashing uh, for files. And the sort of trade-offs or designs that it chooses is that um, the file has to be read-only. In fact, enabling variety on it forces it read-only. But what you get for that is it uses a Merkle tree, as I'll explain on the next slide. So it makes retrieving that whole file hash order one um, 
and you detect the case Song was talking about where if somebody tampers with the block device um, on purpose or an accident, on purpose only if you protect it with signatures, um, you can detect that at the time that you actually read from the block device. So when the file system really reads a page, uh, that's when the FS Verity layer does the tree-based hashing and um, you'd have a read failure versus the normal kind of pattern, which I think is actually easier to see if this picture is here, where like when you open a file, you can read the whole file and get a hash. Uh, that is fine, it works really well. I'm uh, used to only support this format, um, but there are many files where you don't actually ever read the whole file. And so by hashing it in this way, you're like doing a lot of pointless IO that you never would have done versus FS Verity by using a Merkle tree kind of turns that hashing lazy. And on the, the kind of the upside is it's usually a lot faster. The downside is you kind of have to be able to handle a random read failing. So if it's like a binary executing, it'll get sig bus, for example. Um, but yeah, so Verity is kind of powerful in that it lets you do all this stuff and it's fast and you know, secure or whatever. But as Song explained with the built-in signature shortcomings, there's kind of hard to actually use. Like there's no apparent immediate use case for it. Like you can get these super fast hashes, but they don't hook into anything useful. But IMA added support for it, I think last year. That's kind of a good first step and this is another, our project is kind of like another way to hook into it. So BPF can use Verity sort of like as a library to do these efficient hashes. It can then do something sensible with it, which I think Song will continue with here. Okay, so this is our proposed framework. Basically we use FS Verity just to get efficient like a, uh, the checksum or the integrity checksum of the file. And we have like uh, the security, like a uh, binary signing service uh, running with dedicated like servers, maybe with dedicated hardware, or maybe a TPM to provide, to, to store your private key. And that's where we sign the FS variety digest. The digest is another way to say the checksum. And we use XTAR to uh, store the uh, FS variety root hash signature, basically we sign the, the JS and then we get the signature, we store it with the uh, XTARS. And then we use BPF LSM to enforce access control. And for that, we usually have a user space daemon to manage the key rings and load the BPF program and maybe we update the allow list of like uh, signatures that allow to do certain operations. Is this too small? Uh, probably okay. So uh, here's an example, and we hook to this uh, uh, this BPF um, uh, uh, LSM hook that basically you have access to this uh, file, and that's the last place. Basically, you run, you will execute a new binary, and. Um, as far as I can tell, it's like there's no return from there. So basically you set the, like, uh, the binary, you get a new binary, you set your, um, you set your, your allow, if you're allowed, uh, you're okay. If you're allowed to accept, but you failed afterwards, there's no return, so you are not leaking the, the credential to the caller. So basically what we do in there is like we get the current task and we get the, uh, from the file, we get the digest, that's the, your FS variety checksum and you get the XTAR from the file. Basically that's the, the signature and you verify that against your key ring. If the return is non-zero, you just the, uh, keep going, you don't do anything. But uh, if the return zero, meaning there's a match, you, your signature matches your binary, and we set this allow list, 
is a task local storage. Basically, it's uh, okay, this task, we add that to the allow list. And now when this binary want to open something or any binary want to open something, we see whether this file is a critical file that we need to protect. If not, we are good. If it's something we need to protect, we look up the same allow list, which is the task local storage map. And if we get any value, we return zero. This uh, exercise is allowed, otherwise we return one and this operation can be blocked. There's a comment in the chat. Um, uh, so John says, on all the kernels, we did some pointer chasing and found found the hashes, it worked okay, but kfunk is nicer to have a kfunk for it. And the question, the other question is, um, does this handle overlay file systems? The approach that you have shown in the example. So I think there are two two part of it, and uh, we need the file system to support uh, FS variety, uh, which I don't know whether overlay as FS automatically support if the underlier uh, file system support it, and that uh, I don't know. And then if that's, uh, there is a support, whether they're gonna cause some issue, I don't know either. <laughs> okay, I'll talk about what I know. <laughs> so basically, uh, here's the new kfunk we, we want to introduce. Basically, it has uh, to, just to access the uh, FS variety digest. And from previous uh, feedback from when we get this new uh, new K funks, we see like uh, we want to avoid any possible recursion when you call these and trigger another like a uh, BPF program. And so we have the limitation of restrict this to only BPF. Uh, LS, only LSM hooks, and as far, as far as I can tell, it's like all the LSM hooks are designed that they don't, they don't like a recurse into each other. And we also have the restriction with this KF trusted args, meaning we don't have, or cannot do arbitrary like an argument walk. And if you go back to the, you go back to the example, we need this F from here, if you get this F from like a working on inode or working B entry or working maybe this like a bin program pointer, that on the work. So you need, from what I see, this is probably the only good hook to apply this, uh, this case. Okay, the next kfunk, we're talking about the BPF get f x star. And thanks KP for saving this to us. <laughs> we were thinking he to cover that in the previous one. And, uh, but basically we, we do that and we get the file and with the name and the dynamic uh, pointer for the value. And similarly, we limited this to LSM hook only. So to avoid recursion and avoid deadlocks, and same no point in walking, so only certain hooks we can do that. And right now we think for our case, we only need access to this user.xstars. And the reason is like uh, we, are on, we, don't, we don't need uh, like a uh, control, like who gonna write it, because it's uh, like a asymmetric key, just, we just need a allow list. And of course, if in the future we have special cases, we're gonna introduce the security BPF namespace, which will require each, uh, maybe each uh, FS uh, to have a little bit of support in this, but uh, that should be trivial uh, change to the file systems. And this is the latest uh, patch set that we have, which was sent uh, like uh, a little more than a week ago. And that's all we have. 
Questions? Any comments, questions? Uh, John, do you want to talk about uh, what you wrote here in the chat? Sure. Can you can you hear me? I'm gonna, like through the speakers. Yeah, we can hear. <laughs> you can cool. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, all I was just saying is, is we we used FS Verity with um, some Kubernetes deployments, and Kubernetes relies heavily on uh, Overlay FS. Um, and hopefully, I get all the details right. It's been a year or two since we've done this, but the the basic trouble was that in the Overlay FS, the overlay files can be managed can be changed. And it doesn't cause the underlay underlying file system FS Verity kind of infrastructure to be kicked, um, and the result is you can basically have overlays and underlays with different signatures. Was kind of the gist. So, unless you are very careful to manage all this with BPF through like file monitoring and integrity checks and all kinds of other stuff that we had to put in place, um, it, it get it sort of doesn't work out of the box with the overlay FS. I, I think it's more of a um, more of an FS Verity concern directly, but maybe there's a play for BPF. Like I said, we managed to to get BPF um, to kind of monitor both the overlay and the underlay, which was useful. Um, so, so maybe there's something there, and, and maybe somebody in the audience has a FS, you know, FS Verity and overlay FS knowledge that that's cheap, that maybe it's not the same as it was a couple of years ago when I looked at it. So, I'm talking a little <laughs> off the cuff here, but. It sounds like overlay could also check if the, I might be getting this backwards, if like the lower file has Verity enabled. Like the file systems that support Verity, when they open a file, they check is Verity on for this file mm -hmm. via the VFS. So if overlay did that, it could then know that the file is read only and it should disallow writing to it, like in the upper. Or again, I, I'm sorry if I got upper and lower backwards. No, yeah, that makes sense to me. That was sort of my my guess as well. I just think nobody's gone to the to the work to make make it kind of operate sort of intuitively, or or how people would, or at least how I would have expected it to work. That makes sense. And I, I just, maybe I'll just add. I, I think the file system people have some reason that it, it's not as simple as, as it sounds. Because uh, I, I remember broaching the subject, in, I think in an LPC or somewhere with the file system folks, and they, they had a list of, of reasons why it was a little bit tricky to implement. But um, I've I've sort of completely forgot what that list is. <laughs> I can look into it and get back to you. Oh, that'd be great. Thanks, John. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, have you been thinking at all about how to make use of this sort of functionality when looking at scripting languages where the interpreter uh, may have stuff associated with it, but there's no clear delineation between code and data that it's opening? Uh, yeah, we 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 mentioned that we can sign the file as just the binary, but actually you can also send uh, the data file. And so, like we have in this example, we have two hooks. We have just the two hooks. You can have like one hook for when you run the binary. You have one like uh, tag say, okay, this is a trusted binary. And for when you open the, the file, that you can say, okay, this is opening a trusted uh, script file. And for that, we may need a little bit more details because like your binary may open different files and you care about uh, the script you are about to run. So, and so I think with some details like uh, sorted out, this is possible to achieve that you only allow signed binary to run signed uh, script. And if either of them is not signed, you can block it. And 
I haven't get uh, exactly a, a demo of that, but uh, I feel that's very, very possible. Thanks. So <clears throat> you showed the case where you cannot walk pointers with the KF trusted args. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you had a slide after this one. Yeah. So uh, there, there's a uh, there's an example that KP showed where you can annotate a uh, structure and basically mark that if you walk a trusted pointer and you like load that field, then it can also inherit the trusted flag. So then you can uh, basically mark the file uh, struct file inside the inode as trusted, and then you can load inode uh, dereference file and then pass it to your helper. Uh, yeah, thanks for the tip. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know, I, I didn't play with that one. And, but I think the other side is like, we can want to make this uh, extremely safe. Mm -hmm. And of course that's a, a good solution if we know at this hook point, this file uh, uh, structure is, uh, is always uh, valid. And yeah. so we needed to make sure that is the case. But yeah, that's that's a good solution in case we, we have to. Thanks. Any more comments, questions? We still have some time. Okay. Thank you very much.